Why do planets have rings? Well, let's start with this amazing image of Saturn. You have the planet in the center with its lovely pastel shaded clouds in belts around it. And then outside of that, you have the amazing ring system. Very complicated. You can see there are main rings, there are gaps between, and there are lots and lots of individual ringlets building up to make the entire ring system. You can also see the shadow of the planet on the rings at the lower left there. But this was all first observed by Galileo. He turned his primitive telescope to the heavens and looked at Saturn in 1610, and he noted that it seemed peculiar. It appeared to have handles like a giant jug. But in 1612, he was astounded to see that they had disappeared. In 1616, four years later, he noted that there was a pair of blobs either side of Saturn, and he put this down to perhaps a couple of very large moons. This may have accounted for why they had vanished. Maybe the moons were hidden behind Saturn when he'd done the previous observation. Seems reasonable. But we now know that it's down to the fact that Earth and Saturn orbit the Sun in tilted orbits. They're not in the same plane. But Saturn's rings are in its equatorial plane and lined up with the, the orbit of the planet around the Sun. So as the relative tilt of Earth and Saturn changes year on year, we see Saturn from a different aspect and we get either the wide view of the rings gradually narrowing down to a very thin disk indeed. And in fact, in 2025, they're going to be completely edge on to us and will vanish completely before opening out again the other way. It's amazing how thin they are. And we now know that they are composed of millions of tiny, dirty snowballs, chunks of ice, bits of rock and grit, little specks all orbiting around Saturn, everything from these tiny specks of dust all the way up to objects the size of cars or buses, all orbiting independently around under the gravity of their host planet. And we in fact know that all of the giant planets have rings. This wasn't discovered until the space probes went out to the outer solar system, in particular the Voyager probe going out to Uranus and Neptune. But we now know that Jupiter and the outer ice giants all have ring systems, but none are anywhere near as spectacular as Saturn's and are very hard to observe. So what makes these rings? Well, perhaps a broken up comet, icy asteroid or small icy moon may have approached too close and been shredded by the giant planet's gravity. We saw this with comet Schumacher-Levy 9. This was torn apart by Jupiter's gravity as it made a close approach and became a whole series of small cometlets shown in that lower photograph. And then in 1997, on the very next orbit, these crashed into Jupiter one after another, creating the upper image there with the giant smoke ring on Jupiter, each cometlet creating its own impact zone in the atmosphere of Jupiter. But of course, Jupiter is so enormous and made entirely of gas that it was soon able to brush off the impacts and return to normal. No sign that Schumacher Levy 9 had ever existed. Now, a more oblique approach of the comet might have missed the atmosphere and seen these cometlets end up forming a new ring around Jupiter. And that would have been an interesting observation. Uh, perhaps we will get to see that one day. But this is all down to the force of gravity. So let's have a look at how that works. Isaac Newton taught us that a moon in orbit around a planet is attracted to the planet according to a force F, which is equal to a constant G times the product of the masses M1 and M2, the mass of the primary object and the mass of the small moon, divided by the square of the distance between them. And this controls the movement of planets around the sun, it controls the moon moving around the earth, and of course how apples fall from trees. But it also accounts for the tides of the earth. And it's often explained incorrectly that it's just the force of the moon pulling the water up into a bulge. 
according to the law of gravity. And that really isn't quite the whole story. If you look at the situation, the water on the Earth, each water molecule feels a pull from the moon. And that can be from the center line straight towards the moon or from the poles. It pulls directly in the line of sight to the moon, which is either slightly downwards or slightly upwards, as on this diagram. And so you can split the vector of the force, the diagonal line of sight, into a horizontal component and a vertical component. The horizontal component goes left to right in the direction of the moon in both cases, but the vertical component pulls down from the top or up from the bottom. And so it squeezes the water away from the poles. But I want you to think a little bit further and just spin this diagram in your head so that the blue ring representing the Earth is horizontal, not vertical, as it is on the diagram. And the same will be true for the near and far edges of the Earth. They will pull in towards the center. So what actually happens is that rather than forming a bulge on the side of the moon or even a donut around the equator, you actually form a depression all around the extremities of the Earth away from the direct line of sight through the center of the Earth and the center of the moon. So the water is squeezed away from there down to create those two bulges. I hope that makes sense. It's quite hard to explain that one, but it's important to understand it, I think. Well, we're talking about rings, not tides, but it is the tidal effect that is responsible for disrupting objects that get too close to giant planets. If you go within 140,000 kilometers of Saturn, the stress of the tides induced in the object will potentially exceed the strength holding the object together and it will be torn apart and hence creates all those ring particles. And this limit is called the Roche limit. If you go inside the Roche limit, you are in trouble. And we can calculate exactly where that's going to be. Let's have a look. If we have a moon orbiting around a planet, and in our example, it's 10,000 kilometers away, and the moon is a diameter of 2,000 meters, so 1,000 meters radius. Well, we know that the force obeys Newton's law there, F equals G, M1, M2 over R squared. Well, that's fine, but the near side, if you had a particle sat on the near side of the moon towards the planet, it would be a little bit closer. You would have to adjust the value of R, replacing it with the big R, the distance between the moon and the planet, minus the radius of the planet. And so you would be dividing by the square of that. So it would be a, dividing by a smaller number. It will be a bit greater. And on the far side, you have to have R plus R. So the force is a little bit lowered. So the difference in the force gives you a tension in the object. If you subtract the two, you get the rather hideous expression at the bottom there. GM1 M2 over R minus R all squared minus GM1 M2 over R plus R all squared. Well, we can factor out the G1 M1 M2 there and still quite an ugly expression. So let's try and simplify it. If we take that expression and we attack the bottom of it with all the square terms in, there's a trick. Multiply the first part by r plus r all squared top and bottom multiply the second part by r minus little r all squared top and bottom and because you're doing the same thing to top and bottom that's multiplying each of those terms by one that's fine but it creates on the bottom of the expressions the denominators in the square brackets for both of them the same thing it's actually r plus r squared times r minus r squared for both of them so we can common that up and that's the trick we can also replace with r minus r times r plus r all squared that's the same so if we do that it's still looking a little bit ugly but we can 
then expand the resulting expression that we have on the top of r plus r squared minus r minus little r all squared. If we expand that, multiplying it out, doing the squares of the things in round brackets, we get the next line with the red and blue terms. So we get big R squared plus 2R little r plus little r squared minus big R squared plus 2 big R little r minus little r squared. And the big R squareds, where well, you've got a positive and a negative, so they cancel, and the little r squareds also cancel. And we just get two lots of 2RR r out of it. So that simplifies well, and we get four big R little r on the top. We've still got to do something with this uh, rather ugly piece that's in the square brackets on the bottom, though. But we can. What we can use is the A plus B times A minus B rule, which tells us that, that those two terms multiplied together will be A squared minus B squared. And we can recognize that that's what we've got on the bottom of our expression. So we can replace big R minus little r times big R plus little r with big R squared minus little r squared inside the square brackets, all squared, okay? Phew. Now we need to apply an approximation, and this is another neat trick. Because big R, 10,000 kilometers, is much bigger than little r, which was 1,000, uh, what, one kilometer, 1,000 meters, hugely greater, the square of them is vastly greater. It's just enormous. So we can just ignore the subtraction of little r squared. Replace big R squared minus little r squared with just big R squared. A very good approximation. And so we do that, and the piece in the square brackets, then squared, just gives us r to the power 4. So our expression simplifies to 4 big R little r over big R to the power 4. And you can cancel an r top and bottom and get 4 times little r divided by r cubed. So the tension in the object finally is revealed to follow an inverse cube law. An inverse cube is a very steep curve. So if you go a little bit closer, if you halved the distance, you would multiply the tension by 8. If you went to a third of the distance, you'd multiply it by 3 cubed, which is 27. So the tension would get absolutely enormous as you approach the planet. And this is, of course, why this is such an aggressive shredding process. It's also, you notice, it depends on little r, the size of the moon. And so the larger the moon is, the more the tension will be. And so tiny little objects are safe. They don't get shredded. So the ring particles being small up to the size of cars or buses are fine. But anything larger than that is suffering a considerable amount of tension and is likely to get torn apart. So if you go within a certain figure where the tension exceeds the strength of your object, then you will get shredded. And that's why the large planets have rings. And just to finish off, Let's talk about Mars and its moons Phobos and Deimos, shown here. Mars's moon Phobos orbits around Mars quite closely and in the wrong direction. It's in a retrograde orbit. And retrograde orbits are bad. They tend to result in you spiraling in towards the planet. And Phobos is indeed doomed. It will in about 50 million years time, either crash into Mars or quite possibly get shredded as it goes within Mars's fairly small Roche limit, leading to a set of rings around Mars. Now, sadly, uh, 50 million years is such a long time that we're never going to see it, but uh, eventually Mars might look more like this and have its own set of rings. But of course, eventually, even the, the ring particles suffer and will interact with the thin atmosphere, the exosphere around the planet, and they gradually spiral in very slowly 
accelerating down and burning up in the atmosphere. So rings are only temporary, but what isn't? Thanks very much for listening.